But I think that one of the interesting themes that seems to be coming up in a few places here is spanning the gap of IPFS as a mental model, um, which feels like both like a macro and a micro thing. Um, Move uh, and Agrigor, they were sort of talking a bunch about how just abstracting over multiple P2P technologies can make it easier to sort of just get people over that hump. Um, Carson, make it easier for people to fail faster. This idea that, hey, can we, can we have more people come and iterate, make their way over, see what works, see what doesn't. And then Dietrich, this comment, don't go full IPFS <laughs> and introduce people slowly. I think it was a pretty phenomenal like, strategy for actually crossing this divide. Boris, flipping it to you, what do you think? How, is, is that the right way to interpret some of what we've been hearing? How would you take that from there? Uh, so lots of things uh, resonated all throughout this. So what Fission is doing is trying to put a full application model uh, on top of IPFS. And we thought we could focus on that. And then we slipped down the slope that Carson had to slip down. And uh, we found ourselves having to invent a decentralized auth protocol. Good news, much like the web two days when we had to invent OAuth because it turned out that putting passwords uh, into arbitrary third-party clients or having to figure out how to extract an IPFS node key and put it things uh, actually has generated lots of stuff. And, and in fact, we've gotten lots of adoptions around that. And it's, it's going lots of interesting places uh, with, uh, with UCAN. Um, uh, Carson also called out to the thing that I'm going to write a post that says IPFS has won. The dot, dot, dot here is kind of like, oh shit, now we have a lot of work to do. Uh, so, and, and I think a lot of the other things in here, what has won is content addressing and hashes and the concept of self-verifying data. And even that, that mental model is just kind of barely there. How you get to it, uh, the vast majority of people fetch these things through IPFS gateways. The vast majority of people fetch them through IPFS.io as a gateway. Uh, and we can see that some of those, what, what some of those problems are. Without Fission attempting to build an entire application model on top of IPFS, we don't get to some of these other things. Um, we start um, hitting issues with Go IPFS. We think we're dumb and we're like, hopefully someone else is smart. Um, we start, fi we finally, it take us, takes us nine months to find the right people, uh, Cake and Y. And they're like, oh, actually we can introduce you to all the right people. Um, and we start meeting with other IPFS implementers and we realize everyone has the same problems. And that in some ways, a central IPFS.io has been papering over some of these things uh, for a while. Um, and, um, and yeah, so I think there's a lot of stretch around a lot of these things, but um, now, uh, I mean, one thing that hasn't come up that I wanna focus on um, is in fact some of the tensions of having a large entity building a lot of things versus a model where more things are actually pushed out in different ways. Um, and, and a large entity can do things like do convening, do an IPFS camp, uh, have specs where everyone gathers and talks about their use cases together and then goes off to their implementations. Um, I've spent a lot of time in the Ethereum community. Some of the things that were mentioned earlier are incorrect um, and have in fact failed. Uh, there aren't a lot of Ethereum node implementations. Like there are, but only one is fully funded with infinite runway by the Ethereum Foundation. This has been fixed with ETH2 clients in interesting ways. And there's an argument to be made um, that some of the really hard parts, and I'd look at something like uh, IPFS mobile libraries. We should not build those more than once. Go mobile is probably the not right the base for that. Really hardcore, low level performance libraries that actually tackle the challenges on mobile that get built once. So that's an example where it's like, no, no, we shouldn't have multiple implementation because that's really hard. That's the Lego piece, the smooth plane wing that needs to be shaped and tuned for a specific use case. Whereas many other layers like a general SID library there should be a bazillion implementations of that because that's the layer that has fully won and is quite easy to read and write in, in, in different ways. So I'd say that we need to keep picking, choosing that, convene, have a more open tent, migrate some things out of individuals, um, uh, orgs into more uh, of, of uh, community style things and then look for models to actually just adopt more people in. We want more people at the table. We want to know, don't worry, we're like all learning together.
that's my opener. More, more people. I, I, I agree. I think that's one of the, like the, the, the TLDR of everything that I just talked about was like, Hey, look, look at all the different people. There's all these different groups that we work with. And a lot of this is us going to those groups and we rock up with a, a single implementation it's designed with a specific set of assumptions in a single operating environment, single set of requirements. And it's, it, even though it seems flexible and it seems like a toolkit for building P applications, it ends up being a pretty big barrier. Um, more, uh, I think more, more diversity in our ecosystem is going to make it stronger and really increase. I think, you know, like the, the, to the, the vector of choose of choice there. And I think choosability is one of the things like, and I think what Boris, this really, it's really nuanced, right? Like we want a lot of choice, but not too much choice. And that's really hard balance to strike. And we've seen that in, in the web platform choices. We've seen that in JavaScript world for sure. Um, where the explosion of choice has led to incredible. Somebody call times. me when the butler wars are over. <laughs> right. Like it's, it's, a, it's really hard balance to strike, but I think when you're talking about, uh, deep platform integration, like something like native iOS support or native Android support for sure. But yeah, I think the, uh, doing, doing that once and letting people wrap it in the way that, that it, it works with a higher level abstraction, great. Um, one of the things that I, for, for me, that I think, and I'd love to hear from a Dean on this, is really a question for you. A lot of what we're talking about is kind of like this, these, the, the veneer, like the, 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 far, the furthest out abstractions. Of, on top of this protocol, not necessarily the core implementation. And I can, I can call, you know, talk about all the challenges that we've had with different groups and different people and how hard it is to get IPFS into weird places. And, you know, you hear me all the time talking about this stuff. But a lot of the times, like the, 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 what it, like the intractable part is actually that network layer and the architecture of the DHT and how, how like when IPFS is, is working at its optimal, a whole bunch of things are happening that people, I think, take for granted and don't understand how it actually works. And I always end up coming and talking to you. Um, yeah, I, I think, I don't know if this is the right way to, to phrase it, but I, to some degree, I think that we have talked for a long time about like IPFS more broadly and it has been said repeatedly over a long time, like IPFS not equals, and you know, I guess I'm giving away my whole talk, which comes after this, but like we've been, uh, you know, a lot of like IPFS not equals like IPFS public DHT does not equal bit swap, does not equal TCP or MPLEX or whatever, right? Does not equal those things. But for, you know, a variety of, of possible reasons, it still sort of sticks with people in that way because they don't have so much exposure to alternatives, I think is one possible answer. Is it the only, is it the only possible reason? No, but it's, it's maybe one. Um, you know, an example of this is, um, you know, pure, like having authentication to some degree in for, for BitSwap. Uh, people have asked, how do we do this? Um, and for a long time it was like, well, already in the protocol, you can do this based on peer IDs. We can change the protocol so you can make it do other things, but right now it works with peer IDs. And they'd be like, but like there's no API in Go bit swap and Go IPFS doesn't have a flag that's like dash dash IPFS add dash dash for Brendan, right? There's no flag there. So like, does it work? Um, <clears throat> and yet like someone who, who joined like, you know, the community put this thing together in like a week or so. Cause they just went and were like, we, it was like, oh yes, no, I believe you. I bet you, if I go look in this part of the code base, I can go change it. Um, and that's just an example of like, it's like, there's like the mental blocks that happen even before the code blocks, even before the, the various gross code things that Carson mentioned and, and Hugo mentioned and, you know, et cetera. Like <laughs> um, even before those, there's like mental blocks before you're willing to open a code editor and like, see what's up. Um, and hopefully, I think trying to promote more implementations and make this more like visible will will help people get used to the fact that like it gets to look a little different. It doesn't all have to look the same way. Um, That's great. We have a question from uh, the <clears throat> YouTube stream. 
Is it in the, uh, Kevin Mir Muhammad Sagedi asks, is it in the cards to have native Android and iOS libpwc implementations, something that we can import in React Native? It's, This is, a, this is a topic. It's like specific yeah. technical question. <laughs> I, yeah. Well. Well. Actually, I think it, it's really like this is exactly the question that we kind of get all the time. How can I have the IPFS thing that works with my stuff in my way? Um, and and the you know what native means, I think is really like in, in the question that that Mosh asked earlier. What native what native means is really un, undefined. Um, it, if it's functional, you know, is is that native enough? Um, Oftentimes, though, and I think this is why I can kind of why I was asking about the DHT specifically, like it, if it is reliant on some other external massive network that you don't control and can't connect directly to and be a first class citizen of, how functional can it be? And I think that's where we're playing all the time, like like pushing on these barriers. And and Boris is nodding because just all the challenges they've had trying to get this stuff working in the web platform, um, in 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 the, like the, the global scope of a window, you know, in a in a in one tab in a browser. Um, so we're in so many ways we're pushing on the boundaries of of how close can we get? What does it mean to be a first class citizen of of that network and have that implementation actually function? And so I, in React Native. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yes, you can do it. But if it is not a first class citizen of what the DHD is unclear how native that actually is, how functional it's going to be. So this is exactly it. So we need to be realistic and we have to be pragmatic about some of these things about which parts of the IPFS has won we start prosecuting and where we make those trade offs. So as an example, the very first thing that we should have is we have a great library for making local car files and uploading them to an HTTP S endpoint uh, in classic RESTful style. You are unblocked from doing that today. There probably need to be some like basic SID and car libraries that are that are shareable. Um, a car file being a way to uh, bundle a bunch of SIDs together in sort of an offline way. Um, um, and this, we want to keep the integrity of um, uh, IPFS as self-authenticating data. Oh, I can trust it. Right? It was here locally. I can push it. The fact that it used an HTTPS transport and used a server to do some other stuff. One of the things that my team is working on something that I've been calling the append endpoint that will do some of this. You will, you will upload a file and it will, it will do DAG surgery on the server uh, to put it at a particular uh, uh, location in a directory. Um, so Fission's approach, there's, there's all sorts of other stuff that we have that is like baggage. So um, some of you have heard me rate, rant about pinning before. Most people who run IPFS at scale turn off automatic pinning garbage because it's a garbage collection internal thing, and it has leaked all the way to end users. Um, from our work with end users, what do they care about? They want my stuff to be online. And so we went ahead and designed a file system and have file system roots where my stuff. And so we are pinning, we are keeping a single IPFS hash around, but it represents the entire file system. So for Mo's uh, earlier thing of wanting to be able to like share stuff together, that's been on my hack list that I should write up publicly somewhere where ideally you can literally just put a little DNS link somewhere where boris.fission.name is something that Mo could put in this little file and all of that SID would just like stick around. That's a lot of stuff we're stacking on top of things and it has zero to do with the DHT. If we want mobile clients to participate in Crusade broadly and trust that these hashes are awesome and that if even one person cares about keeping them around, even if IPFS goes around, my mission is to have every human on the planet to be able to put stuff online effectively for free forever. It will be ugly. It'll be a hash. It won't be a rented DNS name. It won't support IPNS. But at the very least, we can keep human data around in perpetuity if even one person cares or you know, keeps it on a, a USB key and plugs it in the future. And that's where a lot of us were working on a bunch of other things of all the other exciting things that IPFS does, we need to dial back our stuff and be like, can I put a file on IPFS and get a hash back in all the places that I want? I think that's a really great <clears throat> jump off point. And because as we've been talking about this sort of, uh, makes me think about the intersections between clients 
and like what we and the spectrum of sort of thickness, right? We talk about a thin client, a thick client, server, you know, something in, in my mind, Boris, uh, something that can just hash and and create a car file that is content addressed is 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 in many ways I, I see that as the foundation of a thin client uh, sort of origin, and then participation in the DHT, this question of citizenship, like is your capability to be first class is like a thickening process. I think on another axis, we have this question of like, what is the difference between an application and an implementation of IPFS? And I'd, I'd like to put that to this group. Like, do we see a distinction there? Is that a healthy question? Um, you know, Dietrich, you're talking about this, this question of like, we don't, HTTP doesn't have like an application platform. Um, but then Dean, when we were talking about sort of documenting the number of different uh, implementations of IPFS, there are a number of projects listed on there that in my mind sort of might actually be classified as applications. Right, and so I, I'm wondering if that's a healthy distinction. What is the difference, and how other, where others would draw the distinction, if they would? Um, yeah, I, I guess there's probably a distinction to be drawn, but I don't know if that's where I would I would put like I would put like the thing that needs to happen to some extent, which is. And again, you know, more more giving away of things for for the next talk. But like, if if I'm just doing content addressing, right, and I don't really care where the data arrives from because I can verify it, um, my application is going to have lots of should have lots of interesting ways in which to get the data, and maybe they'll have some standard ones, and maybe there'll be some ones that are specific to me. Uh, I, I have an application. My application has like, I have a social graph with like a few people and I'm going to start checking with them or we've agreed for something. Like there are all these extra mechanisms that are going to come in that, you know, an IKFS implementation doesn't have to care about, right? You could just be, oh, I'm just going to use public DHT. I don't care that Brendan probably has my stuff and he's my friend. Nope. Or you can decide to like leak it in and be like, oh, actually, my application can choose to do extra things with the IPFS components because like I know more, I know better, right? The, the people who built some of the library tools has, you know, gave me some tools to work with, but like, I know what's best for my users. I know what I want for them. Um, and so I think like, you know, maybe you could decide like there are library components that are implementation E and that you can start to compose them, but like, at the end of the day, all of these things should be, you know, set, you know, configurable to what the application developer needs. And they're gonna be deciding what the IPFS stuff looks like. So, and, and again, the word app here is overloaded in a many, many different ways, right? Uh, another one of my missions is to kill the LAMP stack um, because it is naturally centralizing. So part of it, like, and it, it shouldn't just be that we like take the A out and replace it with, um, with I, the limp stack. Oh my God, that's so terrible. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, because as Dietrich said, we have new components so we can think about this differently. Um, uh, you know, I think there are some DX goals, right? So um, I, I would like, again, I'm very much I, so this is some of the stuff that we're driving towards is like, uh, when I say any human should be put a file, a file on IPFS and like keep it there forever, every, every human should be able to publish an app in uh, like sort of running on the web engine, let's put it that way, um, in, in, a, in a similar way. So, um, I'd like some uh, protocol and implementation pieces, right? We have IPFS 404, and then we realized, oh, well, we we actually need SPA support just like Netlify or Vercel does. Um, so we put someone on uh, putting a PR into Go IPFS, which we are supporting as the main implementation that's out there today because we don't have the resources to replace all this ourselves, and we want to make it portable at the protocol level. So working on spec level stuff to say, hey, let's put redirects in to the protocol directly. Again, that crosses over. In reality, we could have solved that at the Nginx layer. People who run IPFS in production, most of them run Nginx in front of it. So this is an application architecture of some of these things that goes all the way to ops and how you put this together. We could solve it 
at a non-spec, non-protocol wallet at the Nginx layer. And then immediately, if someone accesses that IPFS app stack somewhere else, because that's the beauty of content addressing, it will break and not work because it's not in the protocol. And so we need to be realistic about both of these things. You know what? You need to put these things together to robustly run things in production. And also, there are some things that we should put in. And all of these things have to be displayed in such a way that isn't like our experience coming in. We basically like tripped on all the same foot guns that everybody else did. But because mostly there's just one big IPFS.io like team that runs it for with a specific needs, we had to learn some of that from scratch. So I think there's 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 all these things in all of these different layers that we actually need to push the brownies of have people figure some of these out and and give them the tools so that they can figure out what's specific for their application stack needs at at, at various layers. Yeah, you know, I, there was a, a bit I removed from one of my slides that um, it, that like the backwards compatibility is the best thing with HTTP is the best thing we ever did for adoption. And it's also the biggest possible trap and one of the biggest barriers towards people actually learning IPFS and figuring out how to deploy it, build it, build on top of it. Um, what one, one challenge, I think, you know, both Boris, you and Nadine have, have talked about kind of like protocol configurability and extensibility. And one thing that IPFS does that I think is really interesting is that that we have really strict layers, really strict layer adherence between the protocol layer, the network layer, the protocol layer, and the application layer. You really build on top of IPFS. Uh, it's very rare that you see somebody actually kind of reconfiguring the protocol um, to do different things. And I think with HTTP, we think that that's actually happening as well, but HTTP headers actually like almost the entirety of the extensibility of what we consider the web application environment is actually just the extensibility of the headers for HTTP. And so a lot of what we consider application layer logic is deeply embedded in every single message the protocol sends. And that is, uh, with, with, I feel like without acknowledging how tightly integrated the HTTP application stack is, it's really, it's really unfair to say that we have that level of extensibility with, IP, with IPFS, because we, we actually don't. Like, there's not really a way to do that with IPFS the, the, today. The, the, I mean, and the depths are so dark here in, in, in uh, or not dark, but deep in this, we, like, like um, we need to do this talk, this same talk about IPLD. And people are like, did you deploy a planet scale structured database when no one was looking? And uh, so my team is thinking about some things like autocodics and putting WASM in there and adding a VM to IPFS. What? And so I think this is the challenge is that um, we should really be pushing people to not go like, don't LARP HTTPD, but with IPFS, right? Really understand what we're using it for and what's really value, including being like, you know what? No, you should just do a REST API and some sweet, sweet HTTP, right? Like that's like, you, you don't mean, it's it's the same sort of thing of like, should we sprinkle a blockchain on it? It's like a lot of the time, no, including the fact that IPFS has many of the same properties that a lot of people look only for, for blockchains to. Um, uh, oh, you've got Merkle trees and you've got these structures and it's immutable and it's self-verifying. And, and uh, but people are then looking for where are the accounts? Where are the end user accounts? Um, and so we're stuck actually between these two things. We shouldn't LARP as HTTP. And uh, we should probably say that a lot of the things that people want blockchains for are actually provided by IPFS. Um, and um, yeah, that's a lot of different layers uh, to, and, and audiences to serve. But I think that's a really interesting point <laughs> because I would like, while we're talking about don't lark HTTP, we're also talking about like, wow, look how far you can get on just kind of generic metadata, right? Like the headers. And uh, Adine, we've we've been talking a little bit on about in the IPFS implementers working group on the IPFS Discord, which you should join in the middle of a panel discussion. Hopefully, this is showing up on your YouTube feed. Sure, um, <laughs> but. You know, metadata conversations are starting to surface, right? The idea of adding, attaching tokens to BitSwap as an example. And I think um, th that story feels like we're just starting to crest into that um, as we sort of have these conversations about 
building and, and advancing the protocol. It's, to me, that strikes me as a really, like a really interesting point. Like we haven't actually formalized a conversation about like, hey, how did you do metadata stuff? And like, as someone who built an application on top of IPFS and use it as a library, go IPFS as a library before we were supposed to use it as a library. Uh, there was, we did a lot of like construction of what might have fit into a metadata layer as a custom lib P2P protocol, because that felt cool <laughs> and, and really like uh, <laughs> to be blunt about it. But I guess um, I should try and turn this into a question. And I guess my question really is like, when we talk about let's not let up HTTP, you know, the upside of IPFS is looking at some of the internet stack sideways. How do we keep some of that magic and still provide some of the like easy scalability that comes from just like headers? So I'm, I'm gonna answer part of the question and then sort of answer something that's a little bit related to some stuff that came from the last one. Um, I think this idea of like, what is configure, how does configurability look like in an IPFS world is, is sort of interesting. Um, we'll call it like, like doing like authentication and stuff that allows you to, to sort of pass, you know, so like, oh, you know, here's, here's the reason why you should give me data. It looks a little bit like headers, a little bit of that feeling. Areas where it gets like a little more complicated are, I, I've decided that like, you know, uh, ATP, the, the Adean transport protocol is the best protocol and it is the only one that my implementation will support. And it turns out that that's, you know, I, I can't, I don't speak TCP or quick and can't really talk to anybody else. And so data from, you know, people who use my implementation may not be usable from data, you know, from people who use your implementation. Um, and then maybe somebody decides to build a bridge where they like vacuum up all the data and they like sort of bridge it over or something. And how we help people like navigate what that means when you get to like change things so substantially like that, where you can sort of, because IPFS does work in offline environments, you can create segmented networks that don't talk to each other. Uh, and in the same way that like Boris was mentioning, oh, like IPFS.io, like papers overall. To some extent, one of the ways in which it does this is it's like, oh, if it if it if it loads on IPFS.io, like that's probably IPFS-y enough for me, right? Um, and maybe that means it's advertising the DHT, or maybe it means that the folks who run the IPFS.io infra peered with some peered with some other companies that didn't advertise all their data into the DHT, and so yeah, that, that counts that counts good enough too, right? Um, and figuring out how we want to yeah, I guess in, both empower differentiation and allow people to build different versions of this, but also help people figure out like what's going on and how the pieces do and don't fit together um, is useful. Maybe that looks a little bit like the, the crazy, like, can I use it for JavaScript where you can find out which browsers implement which wacky new JavaScript things today. Um, or, maybe it's, or maybe it's other sorts of tooling, but I think that's part of it. I think it absolutely is. And I think the other half of this is us. So this is some of the stuff of coming together as a community. So if you say, can I use this? What you're actually saying is you're saying a centralized uh, area where we all come together and we do some interop testing and we work stuff together. And we we're, we're like, no, no, okay. We're going to get IPFS.io to support redirects and uh, Cloudflare to support uh, redirects and Pinata to support redirects, whatever the number is. And we're going to say, let's do that. There's other questions about which implementations might have redirect support turned on by default or, or other things like that, right? And I think those are where we can make some quantum leaps in various things. And those are some of the things that we can put together as pushes as a community um, while leaving the door open, absolutely. Like, hey, I wrote this custom gateway that does blah, right? Uh, so I posted some links earlier um, because we run a lot of, uh, uh, we put our file system layer uh, on top of IPFS, the standard gateway, um, uh, we use uh, DAG links to point back to previous versions and have this neat structure that is enabled by IPFS and IPLD that is amazing. The standard gateway thinks that I have 1.4 petabytes in my file system um, 
because it doesn't know it, it the, the way that it, it, it just like adds all the sim links together, basically. Right. Uh, and that's one of those things where I'm like, yeah, I don't really expect the standard gateway to, you know, like I, I should put this somewhere and see if anyone else uh, has this pain around sim links that, that we should get around to prioritizing fixing that. And I think that's a really great question. What is the user expectation of like a raw IPFS gateway browser? So that becomes, you get that, that uh, delight and discoverability, right? And, and in some ways, again, it's going back to, and we saw a screenshot from uh, Jeropo of, of the, um, um, the like Apache default directory browser kind of thing. And I think the flip side of that is then how do we, how do we again, show that this, there's more than HTTP here, there's more than files. Um, you know, what are the standards when you look at like a BitTorrent file? I don't know, maybe we do like, like a crazy visualization that shows that it's everywhere or right. Like we, we do want more people to think about content addressing and do that. And we need to um, in some ways as a larger community of IPFS aligned and interested people make some strong goals of what we're going to work on together and then commit to doing it. Um, and it can't be any one org driving that. That is the stopping point. Claps. Claps.